many times on these fields, we tell stories about entire units. And in Malvern Hill, I told a story about the 9th Virginia coming across Malvern Hill. And uh, the comparisons between that fight and Pickett's Charge here at Gettysburg. And we talked about John Vermillion. Well, that's one of the individual stories that we're going to tell here today at Gettysburg. The Battle of Gettysburg at Pickett's Charge. in the shadows of Robert E. Lee today, out here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And no doubt, a lot of the Southern officers that fought with the Army of Northern Virginia probably felt as though they themselves were in the shadows of Robert E. Lee. Longstreet himself, not able to um, commit to anything that he wanted to do out here because he had to follow orders. At least that's the way the story was told. The position I'm in right now is one of the artillery positions out here, just out in front of where the Robert E. Lee statue is at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And if you come out to this position here, you'll get a good understanding of how Pickett's Charge actually started. Now off in the distance behind me, right past where this cannon was, or is today, the, uh, the men from Armistead's Brigade were lined up, preparing to go into combat over here. This is how far out they were. The misconception is that the Confederate soldiers actually lined up back there where Robert E. Lee's statue is. The statue itself is supposed to be an indicator of where Lee rode out to speak to his men as they were coming back across this field and where he uttered those famous words, it is all my fault. Armistead's men was standing on this ridge where I'm standing right now, just behind these cannons. And they were preparing to walk into something that many of them had probably seen before at a place called Malvern Hill. Now it's time for my favorite thing, and probably yours too, a little battlefield orientation. If you look back in this direction here, you can see off in the distance, right over there, that is the Virginia Monument to Robert E. Lee. Way off in the distance over here, the North Carolina Monument sits in the tree lines over there. Now when we're talking about the 9th and the 18th Virginia, so the ninth, we're telling the story about John Vermillion. Armistead's men are lined up right there where that patch of grass looks green. They're stretching all out in this direction here. And then when you come up to where this snake rail fence is, split rail fence, and you come just a little bit further past that, that's where the units of the 18th Virginia are. Now, out in this direction, Armistead's men are lined up as the 38th, the 57th, the 53rd, the 9th, and the 14th anchoring it out in that direction there. Just out in front of them, about 100 yards or so, the 56th, the 28th Virginia, the 19th Virginia, then the 18th Virginia, followed by the 8th, 
which should be sitting out there on the road where the farm is, right out in this direction here. And then across that road is the 3rd Virginia, the 7th Virginia, 1st Virginia, 11th, and 24th. Back in this direction here, where the traffic is flowing, is Emmitsburg Road. This is the road that they're going to have to cross in order to get to center of the line. Right over here. Now to recap some of the information about John, he came into the uh, military in Portsmouth in 1861 with his brother Dennis. And they were with the Portsmouth Guards, who eventually turned into the 9th Virginia. And they fight the Peninsula Campaign, and they end up at Malvern Hill. John's brother is not so lucky. And even though he rises to the rank of captain before he dies, at the Battle of Malvern Hill, Dennis takes a massive wound to the chest and ends up dying there on the fields. John doesn't know that his brother is dying and continues to participate in the fight. But when he finally crawls back across those fields, he ends up finding his brother and realizes it's too late. The man's gone. Dennis is transported back to Portsmouth and he's now buried there today, where his uh, graveside monument is. And there are many articles in the newspaper you can find that talks about the heroism of Dennis. John's story is told in a couple of books. And it's mostly related to the battle here at Gettysburg and Pickett's Charge. Off directly over my shoulders here, where that wood line is, the 9th Virginia, and Armistead, and that brigade that we talked about that was stepping off from Malvern Hill, they're stepping out here behind Garnett, and they're about to go across this field. But this field looks massively different than Malvern Hill. The hills are much bigger. The rolling plains are very different. Now, Malvern Hill, they hadn't been to, get, uh, to Antietam yet. Ninth Virginia hadn't seen that. They hadn't seen this northern plains and the northern rolling hills up here in Pennsylvania and Maryland. When you get up here and you take a look at this place for yourself, it looks vastly different. Well, by the time he gets up here, he's no longer a sergeant. He's a second lieutenant, and he's in charge of his company with a first lieutenant. And they're going to go across these fields with soldiers directly in front of me to that stone wall and try to take out the Union soldiers that are on the other side and break the Union army in two. Now, as John Vermillion steps off here at Gettysburg from that tree line that we talked about earlier, and he's headed towards his destination, he gets an urgent request from a private that's in his unit. Now, if you recall, we talked about Vermillion's kindness. In 1855, when he was just 19 years old, he risked his life helping all of the fever patients in Portsmouth and many people credit him with saving their lives. Well, he doesn't change. And here at Gettysburg, this young private comes up to him and his, uh, his co-leader there, and the other lieutenant, and he begs and pleads them, please, I've had a premonition. I think I'm going to die in this charge. Now, the first lieutenant dismisses the request 
and says it's plain silliness because they are facing sudden death. They're soldiers here on these fields and they have to do their duty. You have to cross these fields. Your request is denied. You will get back in the ranks. The moment that that first lieutenant says that, John Vermillion steps in and says, First Lieutenant, this man is a brave man. I've seen him on many battlefields. He has fought hard and he has fought brave, bravely. I have never seen him waver. I have never seen him act like this before. I think that we should grant him this request this one time. First Lieutenant turns to him and looks at him and says, absolutely not. There's not a man in my ranks that's going to stand down from this fight. And if he decides to run, he will deal with the consequences. So the young man gets back in line and they march off to their fate. Now, as they're stepping in formation, Private Brinkley's, first name Mills, is back in line. And they're marching. And to the head of them is that first lieutenant and second lieutenant John Vermillion. They're about 20 paces into marching across these fields when a bullet comes up and hits him right in the face. Private Brinkley's goes to the ground. They get a little bit further, closer to the Emmitsburg Road. That first lieutenant takes a shell to the face. Both of those men go down in this field, and they both die. So the premonition comes true. The ironic thing is, had the first lieutenant allowed him to bow out, which it wasn't unheard of in those times, they did allow things such as that. Had the first lieutenant allowed that, the private would have at least survived this battle. The first lieutenant... Maybe his positioning might have been a little bit differently. And maybe he would have survived all the way up to the wall. But who knows? At either rate, they both died. And John Vermillion lives on to tell that story to many people. John Vermillion makes it across that road, and he marches into the face of hell with Armistead, right on the other side there at the stone wall. But that's where his civil war ends. John Vermillion has taken prisoner of war just across that wall, not too many paces from where Armistead's laying after being wounded. And he ends up being transferred to a prisoner of war camp. Now just imagine what must have been going through John Vermillion's mind when he's standing in this position I'm in now. I can see the stone wall in front of me, the angle, and I'm about to go up and over that stone wall. And as I get over the top, they're at a trot here. They're running as fast as they can to try to break these lines. Low Armistead's got his hat on a sword, and he's off to my right-hand side. You can see him just over there. Imagine. <laughs> and as we're coming up over this stone wall, a trot. Cannons are still firing. The men are starting to get a little uh, uneasy over here because they can see us coming at them. And then I make my way up these stones up to the top and as I get up here I look directly in front of me and I see the Armistead has advanced about 100 feet in front of me and he goes down. He's blasted fight is over. I'm looking all around me. My ranks are decimated. I don't think there's any way for us to continue to fight. So as I'm here, it's either put my arms up in the air, stick my club up, and surrender to the men around me and hope they don't kill me, or try to make my way back across this field, way back over there to where that Virginia monument is 
back to my lines of safety because there's nothing across this field is going to prevent me from getting shot in my back as I'm going across. So he does what any logical person would do, and he gives himself up here, right where Armistead is injured. And Armistead would end up dying as a result of his injuries, but Vermilion would be a prisoner of war. So for John Vermillion, this is it. Right there is where Armistead goes down. Somewhere out here in this field where I'm standing right now, John Vermillion is taken captive. This march is over for him. This battle is over for him. And the Confederates are going back across this field. What's left of them, of that 15,000 that came across this field, they're straggling back. There's no support coming, and there's no way that they're going to win this battle. Eventually those armies go on, meet again and again, and death would continue. Finally in 1865, the Army of Northern Virginia gives up. Robert E. Lee quits. And after that, all the other forces in the field start to lay their arms down. That's the end of the American Civil War. John Vermillion is transferred to Johnson, Johnson's Island. And then shortly after he's there, he ends up at Fort Delaware. Now, if you know anything about either one of these places, they are nearly as bad as Andersonville. The starvation rate is pretty bad. Uh, soldiers are dying from sickness and starvation there all the time. So those camps are terrible. And no matter what books you read in whatever context, don't let them fool you. Every single prisoner of war camp during the American Civil War was absolutely atrocious. The Andersonville camp stands out because only one person was held accountable, really, for their actions. And that was Henry Wurz. John Vermillion would live through the Civil War. He would go back to Portsmouth and would be unmarried. He would open up a liquor store there and live out the rest of his days talking at veterans camps about his time in the war and here at Gettysburg. What a great place to end a story. Right here at the Copse of Trees. Over here at the line the Confederates thought they were going to take and that the Union saved. 
John Vermillion's story ends around here when it comes to fighting in the Civil War. And I thought this place was altogether fitting and proper to end the video here in Gettysburg about the 9th Virginia and John Vermillion right here at the position where Armistead fell. Until next time, this history is waffles.